All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Vintage Computer Festival East 2022. Woo! Yeah. Got a lot of great speakers. Uh, Friday's our technical talks. Um, and this is going to be very technical. Yes, it is. Um, and you guys are going to really enjoy it. He's going to be talking about writing an emulator. Um, he's had experience writing emulators for the Commodore 64, my favorite. Um, and he had given a presentation at MAGFest 2020. Sorry, 2020. Um, so this is Mike McGann. And we'll give a big, a big hand. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I am actually so glad to be here today. Um, this is my first time at BCF, never been before. I actually planned on coming out here in 2020, but there was a small little problem in 2020. It happened to be the same weekend as my wedding anniversary. <laughs> so, I decided to try to negotiate with that, and um, I'd only come out for Valentine's Day. So I said, hey, if I go out for Valentine's Day, can I come to the BCF in April instead? It was a tough negotiation, I was able to make the deal. We went out, I had a great time on Valentine's Day. Uh, then the pandemic hit, and I spent most of April watching reruns of Stargate SG-1. So, <laughs> so but I'm here today, it's 2022. Our anniversary is now on a Monday. So, no worries there. So I'm sure that many of you in this audience are familiar with this computer. This is the Commodore 128. Uh, this is a computer I spent a lot of time uh, learning how to program when I was a kid. I apologize if I just called you old out there because I said I was a kid when I had this. Uh, but this is the Vintage Computer Festival, and like it or not, none of us are getting any younger. Yeah. I actually bought this exact one from a friend, Eric Chomko, who is here today. I'm going to give a shout out to Eric Chomko. Uh, he'll probably try to sell you something this weekend. So, um, he loves to collect old computer equipment. Uh, his wife actually keeps trying to get me to buy stuff from him any time I come to visit. So I took him up on the offer one time and bought this. Um, I have since acquired a Commodore 128D. I got this from my uh, wife's father, a Larry Soldier. Uh, this was sitting around collecting dust, so I figured out to buy a nice home for it. Uh, this is how I have it set up at home right now. Uh, this desk is usually not this clean. It tends to be a magnet for clutter. So, uh, but it's been really fun playing with the Commodore computers again. Um, and it sort of got me thinking. You know, how much would it take to write an emulator for the 64? Now, I don't want to do anything completely comprehensive or anything like that. I don't have time for that. But how about enough just to get up to where you can actually type in the basic program, everybody's favorite, hello world, and of course, go to 10, because you have to say go to 10. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about today, is basically how to get from scratch up to getting to hello world. A uh, quick disclaimer, I am not an expert on emulation. I just happen to have written an emulator. I'm also not an expert on the Commodore stuff. I just happen to own them. So everything I go over today, I hope is correct, but there's always a chance something's going to be wrong. Um, and of course, we're going to concentrate on getting things to work, not necessarily to do it in the best or most efficient way. Uh, so the agenda for today, we're going to spend the first 15 minutes talking about memory. Then we're going to spend the next 15 doing an actual CT, CPU implementation. Uh, we're actually doing a lot of code in that section there. Uh, the next 15 minutes are going to be from there to get to the low world. And then we'll finish with the Q&A session at the end. So let's first talk about memory. On a CPU like this, you have an 8-line data bus. You also have a 16-line address bus. And with those 16 lines, you can access up to 2 to the 16 different values in the address space, which is 65,536, also known as 64K. So when you're going to write an emulator uh, for memory, you, know, you may be tempted just to have one huge array that is 64K in length. So 64K array of 8-bit values. Now the problem with this, it's a little bit too simplistic. It doesn't actually really model the way that the CPU actually interacts with the buses. Okay. So while most of the time the CPU uses the buses to talk to memory, whether that be RAM chips or ROM chips, um, it can actually use it to talk and communicate with other chips or devices on the machine as well, whether it be the sound chip, whether it be the video chip. And can actually talk on the bus to be able to 
manipulate the lines on the back of the computer for the user port. So what you could actually do is take one of those lines on the user port, hook it up to a relay, hook up that relay to your desk lamp, and then tweak the value memory to turn your lamp on and off. That's pretty great. Now I would recommend doing that uh, because it's really easy to fry your computer if you do something wrong this way. And they don't make commoners anymore. So you want to have that kind of fun, buy an Arduino. They're only six bucks if you screw them up and you have to buy a new one. At least it was before the chip shortage. I'm not sure how much they cost now. It might be $60 now. I'm not sure. <clears throat> so we're talking about the Commodore 64. Uh, it actually came with 64K of RAM. As we're talking about before, uh, we only had 64K of addressable space. So where does everything else go, such as like the ROM chips? So of course, a common technique used in the day is that we map these ROM chips into the address space as needed. So here's an example here on the Commodore 64. Uh, we actually have the basic chip mapped in at 8,000. We have the character generator ROM mapped in at D1,000. And then we actually have the kernel mapped in at E1,000. And the great thing about this is that, let's say you're writing something that's in pure machine language and you don't need the basic ROM in, you can just sort of map that out and you get access to more RAM for your program. So on the Commodore 64, uh, there's actually five flashes that control the memory configuration. Uh, two degrees of control, depending on what's plugged into the expansion port. Uh, the other three can be manipulated by the programmer at runtime. So that gives you a full 32 um, different combinations here. Some of these are redundant. Um, but if you actually follow all these here, you'll actually get a correct implementation of memory. Uh, we actually had to do a switch out of laptops real quick. So I had some speaker notes. I think this is on c64wiki.com. Uh, so it is somewhere on the web. So you have to actually just follow this table, uh, and you're actually pretty good to go when it comes to setting up your memory. Uh, another thing, so <clears throat> what we sort of talked about before is that you know, having a huge array to represent memory is just not good enough. What we really want is actually have an array of mappings to actual memory locations. Okay? So that way what we can do is change at runtime what each memory location points to. Okay? So this is an example here what we had before. We're in the uh, low space of memory. We actually have RAM here. And then up at the 8,000, what we're doing here is we want to map 8,000 to point to the memory address 0 in the actual ROM itself, and A1 goes to 1, A1002 goes to 2. Okay? So we won't be able to dynamically change the mapping at the Another thing you have to worry about is, so what happens if you actually write to a memory location where ROM is mapped in? Now, I didn't know. I thought it's read-only memory. So if you try to write to it, nothing's going to happen. Actually, what really happens is that if you try to write to it, it actually writes to the RAM underneath that. Okay? So we actually have to worry about actually having asymmetric access as well. So for any given memory address, what you read from could be totally different than what you write to. Okay? And for the Commodore, this is probably the only place you have to run into that. Uh, but actually, there's some other work as well with like a Pac-Man emulator. Uh, and that, there's a lot more of this going on. Um, so it's important to realize that um, this is something that, that can actually happen. And I only discovered this when I was actually looking at the Commodore 128 startup sequence. Uh, what I was finding was some part of the code was actually copying memory from itself to itself. So it would be like load 4000, store 4000, load 4001, store 4001. I was like, why is it doing that? That makes no sense. Well, then I learned about this. I was like, oh. So I suspect what it was doing was basically copying the data from ROM into the RAM so that when the ROM gets banked out, it's still available in the RAM as well address space. Okay, so we've talked about all the different kind of things we can, might have to deal with. Let's go ahead and actually start working on our actual memory structure. Now I'm going to be writing these code examples in Go, because I actually wrote my emulator in Go. Uh, has anybody used Go? Do you like it? Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> a little bit of a pause, so maybe not, maybe not. Um, so hopefully, you know, if you have some programming experience, uh, this should actually be pretty readable. It's kind of a C-style kind of language. Uh, if you're not a programmer, hopefully my narrative will be so exciting, um, you'll want to stay anyway. So. Uh, so the first thing we want to do is actually just provide two functions that will be the interface for a memory. We're going to have one for reading from memory, 
He was provided with an address. He returned the name bid value. We have one for writing. We can give an address and give it a bid value. And we're going to do this because as long as we keep these two functions the same, our underlying implementation can change. So we're going to talk about that we don't actually want to have one huge array of the bid values. Instead, we want some kind of mapping. Uh, so a good way to do this is actually to have two separate arrays, one for reading and one for writing. And instead of actually having a bid value, we'll have to have functions that actually do the reading and the writing. Then we can sort of change these as needed at one time. And if you do it as a function, it gives you the most flexibility to do whatever you want. So that way, if somebody writes to a memory location, you can actually do the remapping of memory if you want. You can call any kind of function you want. It doesn't matter. So I actually went through three different implementations of memory before I landed on this one. Uh, the first one, I did things page-based, because that made sense for a Commodore, but didn't for the Pac-Man. I did one where everything was just pointers instead. Uh, but then I realized, actually, this actually provided the most flexibility. So I'll save you the trouble now. This is probably worth doing it this way. OK, so once you have that, uh, this is easy enough to provide some functions to sort of assist in doing these mappings. We'll say we actually do have a chunk of memory uh, in an array of 8-bit values. We can provide two functions, one for mapping RAM, one for mapping ROM. When we call map RAM, we're actually going to do the writers and the readers at the same time. When we call map ROM, we'll actually only update the readers. Now, if you want to do a single value, um, and this is actually useful for basically certain registers on other chips, we want to map in one value to a specific memory location. We can provide a map read-write, map read-only, map write-only, and then provide a pointer to an 8-bit value. And then when we want full control, we can provide a map reader and a map writer and actually give it those functions that it really wants. <clears throat> so we'll go ahead and actually do the implementation for one of these. We're going to go ahead and do the map ROM function. Uh, this function is going to take uh, two arguments. One is going to be the base address, uh, where we're going to map this into. Uh, the other one is going to actually be the data array that we want to map in. Now, let's say this uh, data array is 4K of values. Okay? You may think you actually have to instantiate 4K worth of functions in this kind of mapping, but we actually only have to write one. Okay? And we're going to use uh, basically the closure to do this. So we're going to write one function here. It's going to take an address, return the value, and it's as simple as basically referencing into this array here and taking the address minus the base. Okay? That's all we have to do. We have to write one function. Now, to sort of go into a little more detail what's happening here, here's our original mapping that we had before. We basically have a ROM mapped in at 8,000. So what we want to happen is that if you do something like 8,002, you actually reference index 2 into this array. So let's say we take map ROM, pass in 8,000 as the argument. Now, with this function here, if you happen to pass in 8002 to read from that address, what you'll actually happen here is the 8002 minus 8000, which gives you the correct value of 2. Okay? So that's how you're mapping. And then we now just need to copy this uh, into the address space this way, just by moving over. Okay, so we're going back to. Uh, Original example here. Uh, we're actually going to try to do the original bank implementation. We actually have basic um, the other ROMs mapped in. So we'll first do our mapping here uh, by calling map RAM. We'll provide a RAM variable that has a 64k chunk of memory and say map at 0,000. So it's going to do the read and write mapping for both of those. <clears throat> now we call map ROM. We put the basic on top. So we pass in an array and call the basic information at 8,000. They'll actually update all the readers for that location, but actually won't adjust the writers. So that way, you actually try to write that location, we'll actually hit the RAM on read. And then we do the same thing for the charge and ROM, and also the kernel. Um, that's basically how you sort of do your mappings. And then anytime you want to readjust memory, you just recall the mappings, and you're good to go. OK, so now that we actually have talked about memory, and went through a quick implementation of that, now we're going to talk about the heart of every computer, which is the CPU. Uh, this is a photo from inside my 128. I probably should have cleaned it up a little bit before taking this picture. It looks pretty bad there. Uh, but the 128 is actually the 8502. It's a variant of that. 
Um, so we're going to be talking about that. Of course, if you're a Commodore fan, the 6502 is your second favorite chip. Because you know the first one's the SID chip, right? So. so if you want to be able to understand the machine you're going to emulate, you need to be able to speak in the language of the machine. Uh, and I learned how to speak 6502 by reading this book, Machine Language with the Commodore 64, 128, and other Commodore computers by Jim Butterfield. Okay, this is actually a really good book. I highly recommend it. If you want to learn 6502, this is the book you should get. I actually still have this book. So it has survived till today. So. Now, if you don't have this book, uh, there's good news. There's actually a PDF of this available up on the Internet Archive for download. The Internet Archive is a great resource. We actually have a lot of back issues of Computes Gazette as well. If you're interested in those, I know what you'll be doing later tonight. So. Okay, so here's an example of an instruction that we would like to try to emulate. Okay, so this is the instruction to store the contents of the X register to memory location 381. In memory, it looks like this. So each instruction starts off with an 8 bit opcode, with the 6502 is always 8 bit. Uh, the opcode for this is actually 8E. Uh, then each instruction can be anywhere from 1 to 2 to 3 bytes in length. Uh, this one's actually 3 bytes in length. Uh, and the follows, <coughs> what follows the opcode here is actually the address, which is 8103. It's actually backwards in memory, because this is a little Endian architecture. That's the way that works. If it feels the correct way, it actually be the big Endian. But actually, the cool machines do it the little in the way, so. And the example I picked is actually an example that's actually on the front cover of this book. As you can see, the zero character there is actually saying the instruction, and then the one character is saying how it looks in memory. So now, how cute is that? So, if we ever came up with that, that's great. So now we'll start working on our CPU implementation. Uh, we're going to start with the structure to begin with. The first thing the CPU needs uh, is its view into memory. So we're going to give it a pointer to our memory object we created earlier. We then have to work on our registers. Uh, the first thing we're going to need is the program counter. This is a 16-bit register. So we'll tell the CPU uh, the memory address for the next instruction located in the memory. Uh, we then have our A, X, and Y registers. These are agent registers. A is the accumulator where all the fun math happens. X and Y use for indexing. You can also use all three for anything you want as well. We also have a stack pointer. We also have a status register. Now the status register contains uh, various flags. These flags contain the results of the previous operation, or they can be set and cleared uh, to control the operation of the CPU itself. So as we write our implementation, we're going to be working a lot with the status register. But we're actually be working with the individual flags. So we actually want to be working with the individual bits on a regular basis. So there's a couple ways you can actually go around doing this. You can actually just have, oh, these are actually the flags. So I, didn't want, I don't have my notes already, I'm sorry. <laughs> but these are actually the, the flags that we're talking about here. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail on these flags. Uh, but the one way you can do is actually have some constants here uh, to basically represent your flags and do all your standard bit twilling tricks to turn the flags on and off as needed. Uh, what you could also do is just provide some convenience functions. For example, let's provide a function called C to return the results of the C flag as a Boolean, as necessary. Or you could flip it around. Instead of storing the status register in the struct, you can actually store the individual flags as Booleans. And then what we could do is actually, actually have a status register function that will return all of them or together in the time you actually need to work with the full status register. So, there's a couple different ways you can do this. I picked the first way. Uh, for the remainder of today, we're going to do this way because it's a little bit easier to read the code on the screen. Okay, our basic run loop is actually quite simple. Uh, it's going to start off simple. It's going to be a more complicated to go along. But at the beginning, it actually does start out pretty simple. Uh, the main job of the CPU is to fetch the next instruction from memory and then to execute it. So we'll put our example instruction back on the screen here. The first thing we have to do is write our fetch function. Uh, in this case, it's going to get the next 8-bit value in memory according to what the program counter contains. One thing to note about the 8502 is that the program counter is actually one byte behind where the next instruction is. 
So when it's time to actually fetch the next value, you actually have to increment the program counter first. Then I'll put it in the correct location. And then you want to return the contents of memory down where the program counter is. Now this is how it works on 6502. Note with something like the Z80, it's the other way around. You actually want to get the value first and then increment the program counter. So something simple like that can be different depending on which processor you're working with. Okay, now we're ready to write our first instruction. So we're going to start off with logical AND. The great thing about writing an emulator is that the programming language of choice that you're using most likely has a lot of these operations already built in. So if we actually want to do a logical AND between two values, V1 and V2, and this sort of result of that in a variable called R, this is how we write it. Now, with the 6502, you can't actually basically have two operands that are arbitrary. Um, the first one always actually has to be the accumulator. And then the final result also has to go back into the accumulator. So our code now looks like this, cq.a equals cq.a and v2. Now, where do we get v2 from? So we're first going to talk about the immediate form of AND. And what this means is that the value v2 is actually going to be the value that's found in memory immediately following the opcode. So for this instruction and the immediate 42, in memory looks like this. It's 29 for the opcode and then 42 for the value. So to get the value of v2, it's really easy. We just call the fetch function that we just wrote. Now we actually have to set the status flags uh, according to the last operation. With and, there's two that we're concerned with. Uh, one is the z flag. This is the zero flag. It gets set if the result of the previous operation was a zero. And then we have to work with the n flag, which is the negative flag, or also called the sign flag. Uh, this is set. The result, the last operation had its seventh bit set. This is how we write it. So this is the full implementation or immediate and. It's only four lines of code. But there's more than one and. There's actually eight different ands. Okay? And these basically only differ by how we actually get that value of v2. And these are called the addressing modes. So these are the actual eight addressing modes supported by the AND instruction. So we already talked about immediate. Uh, then we have the ones where we're actually going to read the value from memory instead. So the second one here, that's actually going to read the contents of memory location 12, and that's going to be the value of v2. Okay, I'm calling it absolute 8 here. Uh, this also be called zero page in the documentation. We'll also have ones where it's a 16-bit value for the address. Uh, this way you can actually, these instructions can be shorter. You can actually stuff them lower in memory. Uh, we got values indexed by x, indexed by y. We also have some indirects as well. So, let's go, so this is actually uh, the table I use while implementing my version. So you go to 6502.org. Uh, this lists every instruction on the 6502 in a nice tabular format. has all the addressing modes supported by this instruction and then it tells you which flags are affected by it. So if you recall, this is written by John Pickens and later updated by Bruce Clark and Ed Spitzel, if I'm correct. So this is a very handy reference to get. So let's go back to our original implementation. Let's go ahead and write the instruction for when we want to get the value from memory location 42 instead. Well, that basically only changes by changing how we get V2. So now when we call our fetch, that fetch is actually going to be the address. And then we actually call read to get the value from memory. That's what V2 is. So for all these, that's all we need to change. So we don't actually have to do eight separate implementations of AND. We actually only need to do one. And then what we'll do instead is actually we'll pass in a variable called load. That's actually a function. And then that function, when we call, will actually return the eighth value that we need. So this way, the implementation of AND doesn't have to worry about where it gets its value from. Okay? It could be absolute, it could be indirect, it could be indexed, it doesn't matter. And then what we can do is actually implement all of our addressing modes uh, by passing in different functions for load. So let's go ahead and do that. So for load immediate, this is how the function would look. 
simply returns an ATIN value that you just call fetch. That's all it is. Now say we want to read from memory uh, using an 8-bit address. You already did this already. Same kind of thing. We call fetch. That's what we use to read from memory. Now let's do absolute 8 indexed by x. Basically the same thing here. The only difference is, after we fetch, we're actually going to increment that value by the contents of the x register and use that as the address to read from memory. We write one of these functions for each of our addressing nodes. Uh, we're doing a lot of loads here. We actually have some story closing this too. And then you're ready to start building your opcode table. So I have an opcode table here. Basically going to have all our opcodes are supported by the processor. And then the functions for each one that we should execute when we see those opcodes. So we're going to do our first one here. This is our immediate AND because opcode 29. So when that gets seen in memory, we're going to call this function here. It actually calls our AND implementation uh, with the load immediate addressing mode function. So now we'll do the next one, opcode 25. Same thing. We call our same AND implementation again. And this time we'll pass in the load absolute 8 addressing mode function. And we just basically do this over and over and over again for all the different addressing modes. And we're good to go. Now we check to implement all the other instructions. So for the 6502, there's a total of 151 opcodes. As you can see before, uh, we don't actually have to write 151 functions, uh, but we do have to write 37 of those. Some will be harder than the one we wrote, but some will actually will be easier. Actually, a lot of them are so trivial, you can write them in a single line of code. Now my full implementation was 599 lines of code. So if you think writing a 6502 CPU emulation is a huge undertaking, it really isn't. Okay. Now I did write 2,800 lines of test code. Now part of that is A, I didn't write them efficiently. I did a lot of cut and paste things. Don't tell anybody that. Um, the other thing also is that you really, really want to do as much upfront testing as you can now. Because any bugs you find now are easier to solve. Then later on, when you're running the kernel through your emulator, and then something doesn't work there, it's going to be a lot more difficult to find out. So do the best you can up front. Do as much testing as possible. Okay, now we're ready to write our CQ function called next. And what next will do is basically just execute the next instruction. Okay, we've already done this already. So we're going to call fetch, and it returns the opcode. We're going to look up that opcode in our table. That's going to return the instruction function that we want to execute. Then we call the instruction, and we're good to go. It also returns a value called OK, which is a Boolean, letting us know if that opcode was found in the table or not. And if it wasn't found, well, then it's an illegal instruction. There's nothing we're going to do at this point. Now, on a real CPU, if you give it an illegal instruction, it's going to try to do something. Um, but we're not concerned about that right now. Okay? If we're trying to run something, that's using illegal instructions, we're probably in overhead at this point. So, A better option here would actually be to log this out, put some kind of warning, so that when you're actually testing this kind of stuff, you have a condition you're not expecting, at least you're notified of it. So then I highly recommend that. Now we're ready to go back and modify our run loop. And actually, it's now time to create our machine structure, because we're going to use to collect all our various components of the machine that emulates. So, so far we actually have memory. We actually also have our CPU. Now we're going to write our run loop, which is pretty simple. Basically, it's just going to call CPU next and do that in an infinite loop. That's how we get started. Once you've done all the instructions, it's now time to do some minimal tooling. At a minimum, we need a memory inspector. We want to be able to view the contents of memory at runtime uh, to make sure the computer is doing what we expect. And of course, at times, it's not going to do something that we expect. And in that case, you may want to trace the execution of the CPU to sort of get a clue of what's going on. In order to write that, we're going to need to have the disassembler. And as bonus point, you can take all these tools and bundle them up into a runtime monitor. Uh, you don't necessarily have to do that. Uh, I find running this tooling to be fun, so I spent way too much time on the monitor. I shouldn't have, but 
you know, it's a fun project, right? Okay, so now, after we've done that, we're basically ready to sort of power on this emulator to see if it does anything yet. There's only a couple more details we have to take care of. We actually do need to get some ROMs and load this into memory. We're doing the Commodore 64. We talked about earlier, there's actually three ROMs we're concerned about. The best way to get these ROMs is literally just go download the Vice emulator, install it, we'll look through the file system so you find the ROMs, and copy them over into your emulator. Uh, we then have to handle the CPU reset. When the computer is first turned on, the reset line is asserted, and at that point, there's the reset vector located at FFFC that con contains the address of where the program should start on a restart. Now we don't have video up yet, but what we can do at this point is actually just look at video memory. That's located at 400. So what we can basically do is look through there and see if we actually get the classic Commodore startup banner. So let's turn it on, see what happens. And if you do it the first time, you're going to get this. Okay? This is a whole lot of nothing. Well, actually, it's a little bit of something. Because um, actually, these are all 20s. And 20 is the space character. It's actually a whole lot of nothing. It actually would have been a whole bunch of zeros. So, you know, at this point, you know, probably it did try to initialize. It cleared the screen. It didn't make it any further than that. So why did this happen? I don't know. So this is where you actually go through and actually say, okay, let's try to trace the execution and see what happens. So when we do that, we start looking, and you can see that the CPU is caught in this infinite loop here. So what it's trying to do is actually read from memory location D012 and it's branching back on itself until that value is zero. So for some reason, this is not zero, and it's waiting for that to happen, and it's never going to happen. Why is this memory value important? I don't know. I am not a Commodore expert. You know, who is an expert is Sheldon Lehman, who wrote this book called Mapping the Commodore 64. And in this book, it actually details every single memory address and tells you what it's used for. I don't have a copy of this book, but once again, you can get a PDF of this off the Internet Archive. So if we download the PDF and open up to the page that talks about D012, what it'll tell you is that this is actually a register that contains which line on the video screen is currently being scanned. Um, so what I suspect is happening here is that it's actually waiting for the video chip to initialize. And it's waiting for that, for the scan line to get to the top for the first time. That's just my suspicion. I'm not sure if that's the case or not. Um, so what do we do here? We haven't actually done the video yet. We don't necessarily care about this. Uh, so basically what you do here is you basically just give it what it wants. At the beginning of a for loop, we're always going to write zero out to D012. Okay? Is this correct? Absolutely not. Will this work? I have no clue. But the fun of writing an emulator is trying these things out and see what happens. Okay? Our main concern right now is just trying to make more progress. Right now we're stuck, it's waiting for zero, we'll give it a zero. <clears throat> now, sometime later, uh, you may actually want to fix this. Uh, so it's important to take notes and remember that you actually put this in. You want to come back six months later and totally forgot that you could have done this. So when we do that, Let's fire it up again. Now when we look at memory, we actually do get the classic startup Commodore 64 banner. The problem is, with my implementation, when it came up for the first time, it actually said there are zero basic bytes free. Well, there's definitely more than zero. <clears throat> uh, why is it saying zero? Uh, I don't know. Um, maybe it's trying to take the total value, minus the used, and that's the free, so maybe there's a bug with my subtraction. So I went looking through the subtraction code. Um, I couldn't find the wrong with it. I suspect it needed a couple other instructions as well. Didn't find anything there. Uh, so I did a lot of upfront testing, but it looks like my testing wasn't comprehensive enough because we still have a bug. So what do you do in this case? So you go find somebody else who wrote tests. So, so I found this repository here. Uh, this is written by Klaus Dorman. This is actually a test written in 6502 assembly, meant to be run on an actual processor. And the way this test works is that you run it, and eventually the CPU will get trapped at a certain memory location. At one location, it means the test was successful, everything is correct. If it gets trapped elsewhere, that means you have a problem. And where it gets trapped 
will give you an indication of what the problem is. So I ran this through, and of course there was a problem with subtraction. So I actually looked through that a little bit more in detail, and I realized I've actually set one of the flags wrong. So I fixed that, and now we get the correct startup banner. Everything's looking great. So now it's time to move on to video. Uh, I was actually hoping to spend quite a bit of time talking about video, but with only an hour, there wasn't actually enough time. So for this last bit of stuff we're going to talk about today, we're going to go through this pretty quick. Um, so I implemented using uh, SDL2, uh, that's a simple direct media layer library. And for video, what we want to basically do is have a window that pops up with the display, and we want to render a frame 60 times every second. In order to render that frame, there's a couple places we want to get information from. One being the background color, that's stored at D021. We need the border color, that's stored at D020. And then we actually need uh, the text. We've already looked at that before with the monitor. That text is found starting at memory location 400. And then the color RAM is actually stored at uh, D D800. So, and the basic strategy here is you actually want to have two images. So the first we want to do is actually generate a tile sheet over here. So we actually want to look at the character generator ROM that contains all the bitmaps for the characters you want to display on the screen. So we have to do this once. On startup, we just create a tile sheet here of all the possible characters that we have. <clears throat> and then we'll have another image which will be our render target. So each time that we need to render a frame, just blank it out with the background color. Draw four rectangles, that will be the border. And for each column in a row in the text display, you basically just want to find it in here and then copy it over to there. And that's all it takes to do video to start, at least for text video. So, and actually a lot of things on the color was text video anyway. If you play some of your favorite games, it was text mode. It didn't look like text mode, but it actually really was. So once we do that, we get that up and running, and we actually have a beautiful start screen at this point. But what we don't have yet is a blinking cursor. I think we actually have a double interrupts here. Okay? So 60 times a second, uh, the CPU is interrupted uh, to perform certain administrative tasks, such as blinking the cursor, uh, and scanning the keyboard, and stuff like that. Uh, this was a nice animation of a blinking cursor, but now with a PDF. I apologize for that. So, <clears throat> 60 times a second, uh, there's a tug on the IRQ line. When that happens, the CPU can, finishes execution of the current instruction, then starts the interrupt sequence. It does that by pushing the contents of the program counter and the status register to the stack. It sets the interrupt disable flag, so it doesn't get interrupted while doing the interrupt. And it transfers control to the interrupt service routine. Memory location for that is actually stored at FFFE, that's the interrupt request vector, and then that actually runs until, the, until it hits an RTI instruction return from interrupt. <clears throat> then the sequence goes into backwards, return execution to the original program. So now we have that, now it's time to do the keyboard. Now what we can do at this point is actually, is actually cheat. Okay? We don't actually have to do a full keyboard implementation now, we can sort of take advantage of the fact that we know um, <clears throat> how we can actually do the work for the computer ourselves. So we know that there's actually a ring buffer at memory location 277. That's a 10-byte ring buffer that contains the keys that have been pressed. Indexing to that ring buffer is stored at C6. What we can do here is actually, we'll actually pull SDL from keyboard events. We get an event that one of our keys have been pressed. We take the Mac key or the Windows key or like that, convert it to an appropriate Commodore key, and we're going to stuff it directly into the buffer itself. Okay? This is cheating, but this is the easy way to start. So, when in doubt, you can try the cheat first to see if it works. And if it doesn't, that's great. We can actually just go ahead and do a real implementation. But right now, you can try the cheat and see if that works. The other thing you have to uh, be concerned about is the stop key is handled separately. Uh, that's actually stored at memory location 9.1. I basically mapped the run stop key to be basically press control C. 
Okay? Once you do that, run that, you get an emulator up and running, everything's looking great. And next, you finally type in your Hello World program. Uh, this basic program is a little bit more complicated. Actually, my basic is so rusty, I actually have to look up how to write this. So, um, This is basically everything you need to know to write a basic emulator for 64. Once you decide if that was a pun, it was a basic emulator. So, so once you've done that, you've got to work with 65 with two implementation. Um, you can continue to work on the 64. You can actually do some other commoner stuff if you want to. You can do a 128. You can do a VIC-20. Why not? Or you can actually do some other things as well. Some of my favorites have 6502, such as the Atari 2600, Apple IIb, Nintendo Entertainment System. Now, I haven't tried any of these. I don't know how difficult they are. Um, but once you have something up and running, you can actually use that work for something else. Okay. That's basically the if for, that's it for today on how to write your basic emulator. Now, in the event I've inspired anybody out here to write their own emulator or to give it a try, I do have a couple tips for you. One thing is, at the very beginning, you need to collect as much documentation up front as possible and make a copy of that documentation. With the internet, if it's there today, it could be gone tomorrow. The example is, I was doing the Pac-Man emulation, there's this great document, 8 to 10 page document, on how to do a Pac-Man emulator, written by Chris Lamont. It was beautiful. I used it, got it working. I went back later to check it out, it was gone. He got a cease and desist letter from Namco. Mm -hmm. Apparently that stuff is a little too valuable to have around. So, don't rely on it being there tomorrow. If you see something great, take it and save a copy. You also want to do as much research up front as possible you don't want to get halfway through the project and realize you're missing a critical component and that prevents you from actually finishing your project. Uh, also, evaluate the complexity. Some things will be easier than others. The 6502 is only 150 opcodes. It's not that bad. Now, Z80 is more like 1500. So it may not actually be more difficult to do the Z80, but with 1500, um, it's a lot more you have to get correct. And Doing the first 100 off codes can be kind of fun, but getting towards the end can be quite tedious. It also requires a lot of patience. A lot of things are going to go wrong. Um, it's going to be a lot of puzzle solving. You've got to be up for doing that kind of stuff and enjoy doing this puzzle solving. You've got to realize that failure is an option. It's really about the journey of running the emulator, not about getting to the final destination. And then also, smaller projects are fun too. So, uh, I do have my code that I've written for this up on GitHub, located here. Uh, this is the email address you can contact me at if you've got questions after this. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, we've got 15 minutes for Q&A. Does anybody here have any questions? Now, I may not have all the answers, but I, I can do the best. Yes? Do you have any sense at the moment, because I know because you're writing it in Yes. Swift or Go, go, yeah. Um, what is the relationship between the execution of your emulator versus what C sixty fours were like in their, you know, in their own sense? I mean, I would expect you know, you don't have to be cycle accurate. You just need yeah. the instruction people. So what's the problem? <clears throat> okay. So cycle accuracy is a lot of work. Oh no, I didn't. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, yeah. I, so I'll, I'll tell you how I handle it. So you know, for this. At first, you don't worry about that. So you let the CPU run at full speed. Okay? Especially when you're running tests. You know, you want to run tests as fast as you can, so you can run at full speed. Um, actually, when you actually start running the real emulator, you don't want it to run full speed, because it's going to drain your battery pretty quick. So, um, and when you actually have to do the video display and stuff like that, that happens every 60 seconds. So you can run it at that point is, draw the display, handle your interrupts, and then run the CPU a bunch of times. Okay? I was actually lazy. I didn't even do the calculations correct. I was just kind of like uh, 20,000. So I did like 20,000 instructions per loop. Um, and it worked. You know, it's not necessarily accurate, but it's close enough. So. And of course, you can make it really fast if you want to. That's, that's part of the fun, too. So. Got any other questions here? Got me at least one more. Sure. Um, you mentioned archives or internet archives. Yes, it does a great resource. The, the um, 
all of the Commodore materials are all the Commodore materials are curated at, at um, bombjack.org. Okay. And and they've got all of the books, all of the magazines, and they're collected specifically around this topic. Like when you were trying to understand what was happening in the ROM or yeah. disappearing into nowhere. Yeah. I thought about um, Dan Heaps' uh, toolkit kernel. Okay. Which basically does a byte by byte description of what the kernel ROM looks like. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to debug where where you're stuck in it, you can read into it and it gives you a narrative description, not just an assembly uh, yeah. or, um, breakdown. That, that's another thing that to point out is that um, it's actually really fun to do this now because there's been so much work done before. There's a lot of documentation. There's a lot out there right now. Um, you know, your chance of getting stuck is actually not that bad because there's so much documentation you can find. And if not, you can ask on a forum somewhere and somebody can help you out. And uh, basically, the method of last resort is to go read the main source code. So, you can do that as well. Or vice source code, sorry. So, I do got one more story if you're all interested. Yeah, go ahead. So, when I was doing the um, Pac Man emulator, uh, I was having a problem where a certain part of the screen wasn't displaying. I didn't know why. Okay? And I was pretty confused by that. Now, the Pac-Man machine doesn't need a full 64K of memory. It really only goes up to like 5,000 or something like that. But while I was running my emulator through, I saw that there was a lot of things being written to high memory for some reason, up in the C thousands. It's like, well, that doesn't make sense. Why are you writing up there? There's nothing up there, okay? But I, I couldn't figure out why these two things on the display weren't working. This is actually in a track mode. So what was missing was the high score and then the credit display. That's kind of like two odd things to be missing, right? I was perplexed for the longest time. And then actually went and read the main source code. So what actually happened was on actual Pac-Man arcade cabinets on the Z80 chip, they didn't hook up the 815 line or the address line. The A15 was completely disconnected. So what was happening is that when you're actually trying to access high memory, with that not being hooked up, it was actually properly going right into video memory. I suspect it's actually a copyright protection mechanism. So if you actually tried to put Pac-Man ROM in an actual working Z80, then it wouldn't look right. And I suspect it's just because if you're an operator and you're going to put this in location and try to make money, People don't want to play, they can't see how many credits you have, don't have, and if you don't have a high score, well then what are you going to be shooting for? So, these are some of the issues that you run into. So, any other questions? Yes? Did you ever, did you ever run into a, an instance where uh, there was a hardware bug that you wanted to implement, and, you know, because obviously you're not doing cycle accuracy, so you'd have to do that. Now, never got to that kind of specifics in there. Um, and what's interesting is Pac-Man is notorious for a bug. If you get bug like level 255 or something, it completely freaks out. So it's kind of fun to actually um, do the emulator, put it up, get to level 255, and see it freak out. It's like, well, then I must have done it right, because it actually freaks out in the same way. Uh, one thing to note on, I, you know, when I gave this presentation at MAGFest, I gave a less technical one. That was actually more about um, more about telling stories and actually doing technical stuff. Uh, I was asking if anybody there had brought a Pac-Man machine with them. Out of all places, I think Nagfest would have been it, but nobody had one. Uh, apparently there was actually a switch inside the cabinet, and when you press it, it actually just advances to the next level. I don't know why that exists, but apparently it does. So, so apparently, I think you hit like 255 times and you get to the kill screen. Yes? Uh, I noticed that you kind of you skipped the uh, sound emulation. Yes. Like an important part of an emulator would be sound. Oh, it is, it is. But like sound is like a whole topic just in itself. So, um, you know, you can actually do sound just by itself, right? You can actually just write your own SID chip layer and all that kind of stuff without the sound. For the combo, I didn't do sound. For Pac-Man, I did. Because uh, I wanted to get something working. And it's probably about 96% correct. It sounds like Pac-Man, but it's just a little bit off. Yes? 
Kind of a similar question. Uh, did you implement any type of way of loading like cassettes or cartridges or code from the outside that you're not putting in? Okay, so um, disk, when you talk about disk, a disk drive is basically a full machine in itself back then. Actually, it had a 65 inch limit too. That's just way too complicated. Um, you could do tape just like that. I decided to take the easy route out, and what I would basically do, I just, in my monitor, I would actually directly load files from my disk and just stuff it straight in the memory. Like tape Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, you just actually, I would actually have like a load command in the monitor to do it. So. One thing to note about that, if you're loading in something that's like a basic program, uh, there's actually two pointers that you're concerned about. One that's the start of arrays for your basic program, and one that's the start of variables. And they actually initially point to the end of where the program is. So if you load in something directly like that and doesn't know about it, you actually have to adjust the pointers to be right after that. If not, when you start running the program, we'll actually start overwriting the program. So I just did it that way. I got enough up and running. I could play you know, some basic stuff like that. I was actually going to give a quick demo today, but that's not going to happen. So, um. anything else? Okay. Well, I'd like to thank everybody uh, for coming out today. Hope you enjoyed the talk. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much.